Welcome to the Potter's House Salmon Arm Podcast. We are a Bible-believing church located in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. We are proudly part of the Christian Fellowship Ministries with 3,000 churches around the world. We are a church focused on world evangelism, discipleship, and church planting. Here we will share recent sermons from PHSA Church and other sermons from throughout our fellowship. I am Pastor David Bigford, and I will be your host for this podcast. I thank you for listening today, and we hope these messages are a blessing to you and bring you closer to God. Hello, and welcome back to the Potter's House Salmon Arm Podcast. My name is David Bigford. I'm the pastor here, and today's message is entitled, The Tempter, Body, Mind, and Soul. And our text we're going to be using is Luke 4, verses 1 through 13. So if you're following along in your Bible, you can get there. As you are looking in your Bible to, to get there, it's it's just a something that's a kind of on my heart. It's something that's interesting with everything going on in the world today um, is that we need to pray for our leaders, whether you know we agree with them or not. You know, the Bible tells us to pray for those that are that are our leadership. If you think of the exiles in Babylon. They were praying for the, their leaders in Babylon under the, you know, and later on under the Medes and Persians and everything else. But we're experiencing in the West, in Canada and the United States, some tumultuous times, Western Europe as well. And it's just something that we need to remember is that we are to be the peacemakers. We are to be those praying for it. I've been extremely disgusted with a lot of the stuff that I've been hearing online, specifically people you know, wishing wishing ill of leaders on either side of the of the aisle. Obviously, as a Bible believing Christian, we we lean a certain way because we do believe in the sanctity of life and ultimately in the redemption of all people. So that's just something that I just wanted to throw in because we can be tempted to follow along with the wickedness of the world, and I think that fits with this message. This this uh, you know morning or afternoon, whenever you're listening to this, because we can be tempted in many different ways to do the wrong thing. We should not be wishing ill of those that we disagree with. We are meant to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to see people redeemed in his name. And we are not supposed to take wrath and vengeance onto others as ourselves. And so with the recent assassination attempt on former President Trump and with Joseph Biden deciding to, you know, President Biden deciding to leave the presidential race as of today when I'm recording this, I think it's important that we remember that we hope for both Trump and Biden to find salvation in Jesus Christ and to live according to the will of the Father. And we all should be striving to do better and be better and we should all be striving to move closer to Christ. So that being said, let's jump into this with Luke 4, 1 through 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all the authority and their glory, for it has been delivered unto me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on the other hand, and on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. As the Union Pacific Railroad was being constructed, an elaborate trestle bridge was being built across a large canyon in the west. Wanting to test the bridge, the builder loaded a train with enough extra cars and equipment to double its normal payload. The train was then driven to the middle of the bridge where it stayed an entire day. One worker asked, are you trying to break this bridge? No, the builder replied, I am trying to prove the bridge won't break. 
In the same way, the temptations Jesus faced weren't, weren't designed to see if he would sin, but to prove he couldn't. This is something, again, that we have to really isolate in our time and uh, that we live in today. We're living in a very precarious time where, you know, our leaders are, are led astray by their own pride and prejudices. And they are telling us that if only we will worship to, to them and to their, you know, secular humanistic ways, that we will obtain all of what we're looking for. It's very challenging to navigate the social constructs because especially in the days that we live now, both parties uh, in the United States and all the parties in Canada are willing to accept things that are ungodly. And that doesn't mean that we don't have a place to play or a part to play in the democracies that we live in. Far be it, we have to pick the best choice out of what the options are. But it doesn't mean, but it, you know, what it does mean is that we have to be careful that we don't allow our love for a certain politician or our love for a certain party or any of these things to delude us into thinking that they are going to be our salvation. It is tempting to put your faith into man, but you have to recognize that our focus needs to be on the Lord. We have to make sure that we keep God as our reference point and the word of God as our measuring stick. And so that, you know, what, what's the point of the, you know, what I'm talking about here? You know, what do you think, you know, this is all about? So I just want to interject with a little bit of, you know, clarity that I received for some of my early morning thoughts. So the idea here is that we have to add a disclaimer for empathy. Because repentance, restoration, and grace is what we seek. Grace comes from the Lord through repentance. And as you repent, you will be restored. So we all battle temptation in our lives. And I don't want anybody to walk away from this message feeling as if they've, if you've succumbed to temptation or any of the temptations that the world has to offer, that you're written off. But rather, that, it is, that it's an example of when you fall, you can be you can be re redeemed through re repentance because of the grace of Jesus Christ. So when we look at the entire Bible as one flowing story from beginning to end with Jesus as our as our Savior. It's necessary and important to understand that God shows us the way that we can overcome temptation, but there is always going to be room for grace as long as we're able to humble ourselves, repent, and come back to Christ. So as I was listening to parts of the Republican National Convention this week, and I actually look forward to listening to some of the Democrat National Convention stuff, because the way America goes, the world is going to go. Whether you like that idea or not, it is a reality because America has been the arbiter of the world order you know, since World War II. Now, if you want to give way to somebody else taking that arbiter of the world order, then you're going to have to look at the other powers at play, and that's going to be China. And they have a very different view on your kind of Christianity or your kind of freedom than America does on their worst day. But that being said, you know, everything that's happening, like, it's, it's interesting because I was listening to parts of the Republican National Convention, and there were parts of it that made me uncomfortable as they brought in things that don't align with the scripture. But there were other things that were said that gave me hope that God was still in the midst. And I do believe that God directs and he holds the, the heart of the king in his hand. I do believe that. And obviously we don't live under kings you know, necessarily, but still we, we, uh, we understand that the idea of leaders are, put, are, are allowed to be in the places they are because of God. So I want to emphasize that if you failed, because we've all failed, we all fall short of the glory of God that we're aspiring to, or what we're aspiring to is perfection. And that's, that's the goal is perfection, but it's not believable to ever achieve that perfection in the sight of heaven. So it's important to hold to that standard so that we have something bigger than ourselves to look for, look towards. And that is the example that we see with Jesus Christ. If we look at the Old Testament, we see kings that we know 
to have been good kings because they were because we're told in the scripture they were good kings. They followed the law. They followed the spirit of God um, that was set before them. But there's a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of good kings, though. But even with the good kings, there were failings within their life. But what set them apart as being good kings was their humility and their willingness to turn back to God, to humble themselves and to repent and to make a declaration to the Lord that I can't do this without you. So I want to make sure that there is empathy put into this message first, that even though we're going to look at ways of overcoming temptation, we also want to know that there's always repentance for failing. There's always going to be a process of restoration. Now, you might not always be able to be restored back to everything that you might have lost because of failure. We see that scripturally as well. You know, if we look at the story of Moses and how when he struck the rock rather than speaking to it, that sin had, that he had committed prevented him from being able to enter into the promised land with the rest of Israel. But that didn't take away from his relationship with God entirely. He was still able to meet with God face to face and be the representative of God to the people of Israel until he until his death. But again, just as emphatically, you know, we want to make sure that we understand that there is always a potential for restoration. Even when we succumb to temptation, there's a chance for restoration. But the goal is to learn how to live through, you know, to remaining focused on Jesus so that we don't fall to temptation. So let's go ahead and look at what the point is. We tend to argue with ourselves constantly about what is the point. Why must we struggle? Why must we face challenges, difficulties, troubles in our lives? It is a common thought throughout all of mankind. It is it is this that you know sentient thought that separates us from all of other you know God's other creations. Animals and plants, flora and fauna, they don't trouble themselves with these kind of concerns. This is the very root of the human experience, and this is part of my point. Jesus came to earth fully human and fully God to endure the hardships of humanity without sin, to show us that in him we can not only be redeemed, but have an example of the purpose of overcoming temptation. Not to be weakened by temptation, but to be tested and tempered by it. In metallurgy, you know, we we understand that if you add carbon to iron ore, you can make a stronger metal. You can call it, it you, you, you can make steel. Steel is then forged in the fire and tempered to be hardened, but remains flexible enough to bend when needed. It's still able to return to its intended shape without any loss of strength. The really interesting thing is that there are different ways to temper or anneal steel for different purposes. The trials we go through as Christians are for a purpose. Some are tempered for strength, hardness, or sharpness. Others are heat treated with flexibility, compassion, and empathy. But we're all part of the body of Christ and still one family knitted together. So keep this in mind as we progress this morning or evening when, again, whenever you're listening to this message, we're all tempted, we are all challenged, and we're all tested. We're also all built and designed for, the, for, God, for God's purpose. In 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21, it says, Now in a, a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for dishonorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, and ready for every good work. So let's jump in and work through the text. Temptations are not of the Lord. Temptation has a goal. The goal is to cause sin and condemnation into the person in whom it is directed. That is why Eve was tempted in the garden. Satan tempts us to sin and therefore separate ourselves from God. Whereas God tests us to strengthen us and bring us closer to him. The first point is the body, physical temptation. The first attempted temptation of the devil made to Jesus was one that was focused on his physical body. The goal was to draw Jesus' attention away from God onto his hunger. As we know, he was fasting before his exchange and Jesus would certainly have been very hungry after 40 days without food. In verse 3, the devil said, to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. This temptation was a material temptation and can be looked at as the lust for material things. Think of it this way. You could be hungry for food, drink, money, or the newest toy. 
the ability to gain all the stuff you could ever want. All you have to do is kneel to the powers that be. This is what a lot of current culture is fighting about. Bend to our worldview and everything is yours. A, a lot of our entertainment that comes out of Hollywood today says bend to our worldview. You are bigoted and hateful if you don't bend to our worldview. But if you will bend your knee to this new world order, then you will have everything that you've hoped for more. In Ephesians 6, 16 through 17, it says, In all the circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In Deuteronomy 8, 3, it says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So this is very hard for us to understand in our day and age. We're supposed to live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That means we're supposed to be sustained by the word or the Bible, thing, and we're supposed to be stained through the Bible. This is why we fast and why when you fast, you're supposed to maintain a happy countenance, not like the Sadducees and Pharisees, the religious people at the time. The verse from Deuteronomy that was you know, that Jesus cited was to highlight our dependence on God. Today, many of us depend only on ourselves or the government to provide us what we need to live. We are to be content with God and what with what he gives us, knowing in faith that he will take care of us just as he does the birds in the field. So here's some things to consider. What feels right is not always right according to God. Feeding the material desires can separate you from God and your dependence on him. I spoke with a friend about our dependence on God, how the rest of the world likes to think that Christians see themselves as better than everyone else. But the reality is that we just know that we are not better. We are saying, no, we need God in our life. We need Christ. We need Jesus to take the burden of, of this life off of our shoulders. We quite literally are admitting that we do need God's help. The pleasure that comes from giving into temptation is always a short-lived one. It's a quick hit. Right. You you uh, for example, like I'm I'm saving to give I want to get a new iPhone. Right. I could I could get the, the iPhone on payments or I can save up the money to get the iPhone. But I have to understand that saving the money is going to be a better way to do it because I can get an iPhone that's like refurbished or after the 16 comes out, I'll pay less for it and I'll still have the phone I want. Or I could take payments for it now. But why would I take payments? Because the idea of that is I'm going to get this short-lived, short-lived hit that you know that's going to last a very, very short period of time. And now I have to make these small payments for two years or more for a phone that I could have saved hundreds of dollars off of. And I would just wait and be patient. So but we're tempted to spend it and just be done and get it because we want it now. But we have to learn to control ourselves. So this brings me to my next point, which is the mind, your thought life. And this leads into it, right, with that, that silly analogy about the phone. You have to learn how to, to judge the thoughts that come through your head. The next attempted battle was for the mind of Jesus. I can give you the world and all authority. All you have to do is bow to me. This is the song that we hear today with leaders from every corner of the earth. I'm your guy, I'm your girl, I can get you what you want. Fame, money, power, prestige, authority. All that is required is that you acknowledge me as your overseer, your Lord. Here's the passage from Luke again. And the devil took him up, verse 5, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time. And said to him, to you I will give all authority and their glory, for it has been delivered unto me. I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, I will. it will be all yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So I find it interesting that in the same message that has been used throughout history by, you know, petty and tin pot dictators, you know, or like Nebuchadnezzar, Caesar, Kim Jong-un, all these demand that they're vassals to bow down to them as gods. Nero persecuted the Christians heavily because they would not partake in his worship. We know that in the end times, the devil was, will bestow power to the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, 2, it says, 
And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. But we also know that this is a short-lived authority and that one the, that only leads to destruction. In Deuteronomy 6, 13 through 14, it is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. So as we look at society today in the political realm, they are all trying to grab power. Right? And this is the idea of trying to buy in or to take, you know, take away your life. In the sense that, you know, don't, we're getting a little off topic here in a way, but the political realm today is constantly trying to tell you to bow. Why do you think that every idea that they come up with is a flag? Why is it that every protest that happens is some new flag? But the flag that you're supposed to be afraid of is the flag that is of your country. When, can, when the Canadian protests were happening in Ottawa, by the truck drivers, they had Canadian flags. And we were being told that the Canadian flag was being used to harass and terrorize people, their national flag. And the states, you were con they're, you're constantly being told that the American flag is a symbol of hate and divisiveness and to have the American flag present is, is somehow a negative. It'll be interesting to see as the you know Democrat National Convention comes up in a month. Are they going to look like what the RNC had with are they going to have the American flags presented? Or are they going to have other flags presented? Because they put other flags on our police cars now in Canada, the United States. They put other flags when they're protesting against, you know, Israel. They put other flags everywhere at these college campuses, at our crosswalks, all of these other things that they want us to, to bow down to. It's a very interesting thing that they're trying to get us to just kneel, kneel, just submit to it. But we have nothing to fear if we're living in the, with our, you know, if we're living for the Lord. So this brings me to my, my third point, which is the soul and the pride of life. In chapter four of Matthew, you can see another account of this story. But I like that in Luke second, you know, Luke has it where the second and third temptations are switched in placement. The reason I prefer Luke's order is simple. The first two temptations were struggles for power by Satan. He was attempting to persuade Jesus by provoking him to use his power or by flaunting his power. Command these rocks into bread. I can give you all authority. But the third temptation is slightly different. It's now that the devil strives to manipulate the words of God and twist it to get Jesus to falter. So how often will someone try to persuade us to give in to material lusts? And when that works, they might say, I have the authority to do it. It's okay. I permit you to do this or that. Uh, so I've experienced both of these things in my life. Long ago when I was in the military, it was very common to have guys try and get you know, get you to drink or to get you to swear. After all, you are not, you know, one of us if you don't drink or you don't party or you don't go after women. So I can honestly say that I have had guys who outrank me try to order me to break faith and partake in whatever they were doing. They would literally say like, I'm your staff and CEO, you have to do this with, you know, with us. And you have to make a stand because they don't have true authority. They're using their authority unjustly. And similarly, we see this with the temptation story. In verse 9, it says, And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him and said, You shall not put the Lord your God to a test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So the devil this time was attempting to use scripture to get his way. And we get this in our lives. There's no surprise here, right? In Psalm 91, 11 through 12, it says, For he will command his angels concerning you to, to guard you in all your ways. 
And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. So it's important as a Christian to remember the devil knows the Bible better than you do. This is why we pray, why we read the Bible and stay within the body of Christ and why you should have a pastor. If you're listening to this online and you don't have a pastor, you need to get a pastor. If you live at Sam and our come to church in person, we'd love to have you. If you're somewhere else, you need, you know, reach out. The contact information is show notes. I'll get you connected with a lo- with a pastor in your local area. More than likely, we have 3,700 churches now worldwide. But the reason why you need a pastor, why you need headship, is you need someone to speak into your life so that if you start going the wrong way or or following something that you know, following the temptation that's put in front of you, someone can speak into your life. This is why you have brothers and sisters in the faith in the church body. The devil in the world is going to try to use snippets from the Bible to twist your understanding. That's what happens why there's so many different cults out there that use the Bible. They're designed to get you to stumble and fall without you even knowing it. To get you to question and challenge the Bible until you separate yourself from the will of God. How did Jesus deal with this temptation? Well, in verse 16, Deuteronomy 6, 16, he says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. So when the devil tried to fail or tried and failed to use the word of God to get Jesus to fall, he fled the scene. And this is true in our lives also. When others try to use the Bible to get under our skin, it's important to know the Bible enough to shut them down. So here's an example that I I used to have uh, or I used to have to deal with all the time. So drinking. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Mic drop, right? It's over. There's no comeback because Jesus turned water into wine. But in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5, 18 says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. So the issue is authority. Who are you going to give authority to in your life? We are called to give Jesus and through him, God, all authority in our lives. That is why you know, Jesus was saying, do not test the Lord. God has all authority, and we're not meant to test that authority simply because someone other than God came by and challenged us to do it. So closing, let's look at five takeaways from the lesson today. No one is exempt from temptation. That's number one. God does not tempt us, but he will allow us to be tested. Think it. Think of it as you know, like as a hiking analogy. You will never gain strength if you only train on the flattest, easiest terrain. No, you have to go up. You have to think of it as testing as strength training and temptation is the voice that tells you it's too hard and just to quit. When you're going up that hill, you've got to grind it out. You've got to continue to build that strength. And when that starts getting too easy, either you find a steeper hill or you throw some extra weight in your pack so that you can continue to get stronger. But that small little voice that you hear telling you to quit, that's temptation. That's the voice that's telling you it's better to be idle than to be moving forward for God. So number two, temptation is not the same as sin. We all face temptation, but that's not sin. The sin is when you accept the temptation, when you hold on or hold it in your heart and act upon it. The action is where sin is committed. If you're even if it's an idle thought, it's an idle thought, you can judge it and it's done. But if you sit there even, you know, fantasize about that thought, then it becomes an act of sin. So like when Jesus is talking about adultery, and if you've thought of adultery in your mind, that's not an idle thought that passes through your mind. That's when you capture that thought and you sit and you hold it and you fantasize about it. Then that becomes the sin. Number three, respond to temptation with God's word. So using the word to repel temptation, but when that's not enough, fleeing temptation, like the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And so he even, in that story, went to jail, as we know. But the reality is is that, again, with that thought, you judge it. And then if if you're you're judging it and it's still present in your mind, then what can you do? Well, you're going to use the word of God to 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 speak against it. And when that's not even enough, because you're in a bad area, you found yourself in an area where you shouldn't be, you need to flee it. 
Even if that means your clothes being ripped off your back, even if that means that after the fact you're going to end up getting in trouble unjustly, you still have a responsibility to flee that temptation, to use God's word and to flee that temptation. And number four, resist the devil and the power of the spirit. So this comes down to, you know, my three favorite things, prayer, reading the word, and remaining in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Go to church. If you're not in church, if you're not being preached to in person with a pastor that can watch over you and friends that can speak into your life, then you're then you're leaving yourself in a precarious situation where you're going to be an easy target for the devil. You're going to be the lone sheep out on your own and you know, the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. And who better to devour than the Christian thinks he's all nice and safe off in the woods by himself. And then number five, pursue the will of God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Pursue God. Pursue him in your thoughts, your words, and your actions. This came down, that comes down to a, an idea of focus. What are you going to focus on? Are you going to make sure that you're focusing on Jesus with your heart, your mind, and your soul? So this is the crux of the, of the entire message. This is the reality, is that oftentimes temptation will win out. The tempter will win out because you're not focused on, on your Savior. You're focused on something else. With that, with that, if I could have every head bowed, every eye closed, just really quickly. If this message has impacted you, if this has spoken to you and you recognize that maybe you are unfocused, you're a Christian, you're saved, but maybe you're unfocused and you need to get your heart right. You need to tell God and make a commitment. I am going to serve you with all my heart, my mind, and my soul. I'm going to refocus my life to be on you and I'm going to go forward in Jesus name. Maybe that's you, and I want you to signify that with an uplifted hand. Even if I can't see you, God can see you. And we're going to pray in just a second. But I also want to, you know, send out an invitation that if you're not saved, but this message has impacted you, then you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. And today is the best time to do it. So you need to recognize that, that you are a sinner, but yet Jesus has something much better in mind for you than what you have in mind for your own your, your own self. So if that's you, I want you also to signify that an uplifted hand because that is a critical thing for you to you know put your hand up so that God knows that you're serious. So with that, let's go ahead and pray. I'm going to first pray for the for an invitation. This is a sinner's prayer. So if you rose your hand because you want to get saved, repeat this after me. Dear Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner. But I know that your son Jesus died on the cross for me and I repent of my sin and accept him as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So with that prayer, if you rose your hand and you, you accepted that invitation for Christ, then you've been saved. And I want you to reach out and tell me you prayed that prayer. Tell other people you prayed that prayer. And then find a church and get, get locked in. But if you rose your hand because you were convicted, maybe you you walked away. Maybe you're not on as you're as fire for God as you used to be. I want to pray a different prayer real quick. Just saying, dear Lord God, I know of all the miraculous things and all the, you know, that you've done in my life, all the blessings you've done in my life. I want to give you praise and I want to make a commitment to you that I will serve you fully with my heart, mind, and soul. I will no longer allow the rest of the world to dictate how much time I give to God. I will give God the first fruits of my life. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace of mer your, your, your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. So with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to me this long. I want to thank you for subscribing to the podcast, for liking it, sharing it. I really do hope we can get this message out to more people. And I just thank you again. And I can't wait for you to come back next time. God bless. Thank you for listening to the PHSA Potter's House Salmon Arm Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Potter's House underscore Salmon Arm to keep up to date on what we are doing. Join the conversation and discover how Jesus Christ can revolutionize your life.